Welcome back to Believe in Colts. I'm Lawrence Warren. With me as usual is my guy, Colts Loyalist. And today we continue our AFC breakdown. And with the AFC North and special guest with us today to help cover the Cleveland Browns is my guy, Quincy Carrier. Quincy, how are you doing today? Good, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. So, uh, as usual, this is generally a Colts show, but, you know, we do cover the entire NFL. For those that are watching that may not know who you are, where they can find you, why don't you give them that info, please? Oh, yeah, YouTube.com slash Quincy Carrier if you want to hear my more Browns-focused stuff. If you want to see me react to takes along the entire national media, um, check out YouTube.com slash Worst Take. It's like First Take, but it's Worst Take. We react to all kind of stuff that the media puts out there. Just had a video out about ESPN's top 10 quarterback list, so check it out. Sounds awesome. So let's go ahead and get down to the nitty gritty. Obviously, Cleveland has been kind of a focal point uh, this past offseason with the entire quarterback situation that was going around. So when we get into <laughs> this depth chart and you're looking at the whole situation, obvious the obvious big change here is – Deshaun Watson, no more Baker Mayfield. He's over uh, with Carolina. And there's a lot of question marks around Deshaun Watson. Uh, we'll go ahead and get that out of the way first and quickly. Uh, it's going to be a lot different from Baker. Um, he, I don't know how many games he's going to get suspended, right? The range has been anywhere from 0 to 17. So when that's the case, I just kind of wait to see what happens there. Um, but yeah, when he's out there, right? The issue that the Browns offense had last year was that when it came down to it, nobody respected their ability to throw the football. That's not going to be the case anymore, right? Like, you're not going to see a ton of, you know, nine-man boxes when Deshaun Watson's in there in a spread set. So that's going to be something that opens up a lot of the running game. Obviously, Deshaun Watson is a very talented passer of the football as well as a mobile quarterback. So he brings those attributes there too. Um, and the interesting thing about the entire makeup of this team is that even if Watson does play the whole season, the offense is not supposed to be the strength of this team, right? The strength of this team is supposed to be the defense. So, Whatever Watson brings you will be bonus, and that's what will put this team from, you know, without Watson. Let's say worst-case scenario, Watson's out for a whole year. I still think that with Brissett, you can put enough together around them to be able to win 9 to 10 games and make a playoff run if you really – have things kind of bounce your way. I don't think that's out the realm of possibility. But if you have Watson in there, obviously, then the offense doesn't become um, a bottleneck to your success. And then, you know, the sky's the limit with what you could achieve there. So, yeah, Watson is the upgrade. Um, Baker Mayfield, I've been – we've had this conversation a ton in Cleveland. Ultimately, he was just all right, right? Like, he was okay. Um, but he wasn't enough to rely on consistently, and the consistency is the key. Kind of like with Carson Wentz, right? I know there were games where Carson Wentz convinced you, like, hey, man, like this is going to work. And then there's games where Carson Wentz throws, like, three interceptions and two fumbles, right? Like, you just can't deal with it anymore. And it's that roller coaster ride where you just would rather have something more consistent that you can rely on. Um, and that's the direction they decide to go. You know, if Watson plays, when he does, they know that that product on the field is going to be consistent. And if he doesn't, you know, Jacoby Brissett, he's not going to be spectacular, but he's going to be Jacoby Brissett pretty consistently, which is, you know, as long as you leave him within the realms of, what's reasonable to expect out of him. He will give you that. Like you said, you, you said that Deshaun was a bonus or stuff. That's a heck of a bonus to sit there and have because you say this team's built around the defense and stuff, but you look at that offense. I mean, Amari Cooper, you know, Bell through the draft and stuff. You know, these guys are talents that may not get utilized with Jacoby because he's not going to push the ball down the field. Whereas mm -hmm. if you have Deshaun Watson and stuff, that offense is going to open up tremendously. I mean, I'm so glad that Mari left Dallas, so now I can root for him again, <laughs> you know. Uh, and like I said, now somebody I look on here, I see Donovan People-Jones. I think that's going to be a guy that Jacoby Brissett relies on quite a bit because he plays to his strengths, you know what I mean? Yeah, and it, it's, it's a credit to this roster and what they built on the defensive side of the ball that the offense – 
with Watson still wouldn't be what would be relied on to carry the team as far as what we're looking at right now, because it is a very talented roster. I mean, that offensive line is pretty good. Um, you know, Joe Batonio, Wyatt Teller, Jack Conklin, we, we know what that is. And then Jedrick Wills heading into his third year, we expect him to be even better than he was last year. Um, and then Amari Cooper, Donovan Peoples-Jones is somebody who flashes brilliance a lot, but sometimes he also flashes incredible incompetence. So there is that balance with him because, you know, he will make an incredible play, but then miss a very easy play sometimes. Um, so that that's what they're waiting to see about. And then David Bell, I mean, if you ever hear Kevin Stefanski talk about David Bell, he has plans for uh, the, the Purdue product out there. He he really likes him. I'm just interested to see in camp when he's going up against Denzel Ward and Greg Newsom, two top flight corners. Is he able to get the separation? Because that's the only question you have about David Bell is, hey, is he going to be able to separate in NFL? Is some of the lack of measurables that he has going to hold him back? Uh, but if he can get open against those guys, then he is what he was – at Purdue on tape, which was a fan. Like, I think probably if you look at the tape, you can argue he was probably the best wide receiver, or maybe next to Garrett Wilson, the second best, um, based on how you want to look at it. But the measurables really tanked his draft stock. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, some wide receivers have terrible measurables, they can get over, right? Uh, DeAndre Hopkins is somebody we've talked about that. Uh, because again, I think the most underrated skill when we talk about wide receivers isn't any of their measurables. I think is can you get open? That's a skill in itself. Um, you know, there's a lot of fast guys in the NFL that can't get open. There's a lot of quick guys that can't get open, big guys that can't get open. But there are just dudes who can get open, right? Um, you know, that that's what they're looking at with David Bell. He might be able to take that second wide receiver spot from Donovan Peoples-Jones. I would not be surprised if that happens. But, yeah, offensively, I think they're fine as long as, like, they don't have a bunch of injury problems because, again, if Amari Cooper goes down, then you run into a real problem at wide receiver because you don't really have another burner. You have Anthony Schwartz, but we he's really unproven at this point. Running back, though, <laughs> I mean, we haven't touched on running back. This is the most insane NFL running back room I've ever seen Um, because, yes, Nick Chubb's really good. Kareem Hunt's pretty good. Dearness Johnson, I don't know if you guys remember this, but when the Browns played the Colts, he ran in a third and nine to pretty much seal that game out um, in 2020, I believe. Um, and then he since went on. He averaged about five yards per carry. He was pro football focused, number ninth ranked running back um, in the league last year. Jerome Ford, a fourth round pick out of Cincinnati. Main reason they were able to make the playoffs. And then Demetric Felton, who was also really good last year. So the Browns are legitimately going to be cutting a good one, a running back. Like somebody's going to start or be in the rotation of another NFL team that's on this roster because they're legit five deep. Even John Kelly Jr., you know, he, he's going to find a spot on the NFL roster. So. Hey guys, please smash that like button, hit subscribe if you're not subscribed, and tag that notification bell so that you're notified next time I go live. Don't forget, you can also share this video to your favorite social media, and please open up that description of the video. In there, you find a link to my Patreon, which is only five bucks a month. You get all of my content, plus Patreon-specific content, and of course, my merch shop right here. Absolutely. Um, Moving on to the defense, and you said this is the strength of the team, and it looks like it's also where the draft really kind of leaned more heavily into a couple third-round picks and a fourth-round pick sitting there. Obviously, a lot of picks went into getting a certain quarterback uh, for this year. So um, is there anyone on this uh, defense that we don't know much about that was picked up this year that you would like to kind of put a, a a a little bit of a focus and a magnifying glass on, give us a little information. There's a guy like a Perion Winfrey that I think could really be a surprise for this team because if you look at his tape at Oklahoma, he was playing a lot of zero tech. I think he was out of position, had some great moments there, excellent motor, willing willingness to fight, quick hands, all that stuff. A little bit high on his pad level, but really showed um some 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 stuff on tape there but not necessarily what you would think of as like a first or second round pick then you bring him to the senior bowl he plays three tech at the senior bowl and he is the best player at the senior bowl he is better than uh the Devontae carter who is also there from georgia one of the georgia guys he's better than every defensive tackle there he's better than every defensive end there 
He, you put him in these 11 on 11s. He's crashing and, and getting and being disruptive on everything. He's winning every one on one. He's ferocious with his intensity. He is barking on the field, sprinting back to his spot just to win another rep against a first round pick. Um, and, and like with Zion Johnson and everything else, like he would just dominate that and then went on, dominated the game. I mean, if you want to know how dominant his uh, senior bowl was at that three tech spot, he won senior bowl practice player. He won senior bowl MVP from the defensive tackle position. Wow. I think we're all familiar with the only other guy to do that. His name's Aaron Donald, unless you're Urban Meyer. Um, but that is what he was able to accomplish when he was put at three tech. So there is a huge question on Perion is, was he just out of position? And this is why people were low on him coming out of Oklahoma because he was the number one Juco player when he did decide to go to Oklahoma. And maybe that's why he didn't look great. And it's Oklahoma. Nobody really looks there for great defensive players or was he just out of position? And if you put him at three tech at one-on-one, he's a first round pick. So that's somebody that I'm very high on. I think Perion, you get him one-on-one, especially in a situation where they're not going to double him because Miles and Jadavion Clowney are on that defensive line as well. And both Miles and Jadavion go inside, outside. You're going to be able to put him in favorable situations where you just have to tell him, get one-on-one, go downhill against a guard. He can win those situations, I'm pretty confident, if what he did at the Senior Bowl holds up. Another player that he's not a first-year guy, but a guy that I think uh, people ought to be aware of, and I think some people are if they follow the draft, is JOK. Really good last year. Just wasn't being able to move around like you want him to. I think they were really strict with where they played him. Only had him at that will linebacker spot. Was really good at will linebacker. You could tell at times he got bored playing Will Linebacker, so he would just jump in the backfield and blow up a play. But now this year, since he's in his second year, they're going to be more comfortable letting him move around around the field, playing certain different positions. So now his impact won't just be on that one side of the field. He'll be around the ball more consistently. Um, you know, this is a guy who got Darius Leonard comparisons coming out of college. And really, you know, whenever you watch JOK, I don't know if you ever watched him on tape, he's the fastest guy on the football field. Like, he, I don't know what his 40 time is, but if you just look at the guys in pads, 28 he just pops out. People think he's a DB because he's just moving so quickly down the field and he wasn't really deterred by by guards or blocks he was able to get off things his size wasn't really an issue for him um and was able to get in there and do some of the dirty work as well so you know the offense is really good when you look at the roster but i mean like the defense they go too deep on a lot of these different position groups and, and we saw what when they got together last year they kept the Browns in a game where Baker Mayfield threw four straight interceptions um, and just basically made Aaron Rodgers useless at the end of the game to the point to where the Packers had to rely on Baker turning the ball over again in the fourth quarter in the final drive of the game to win that game um, again in a game where Baker turned the ball over countless times. So that's the level that defense was playing at. And they were putting up with that adversity all year, turnovers, three and outs, you know, short fields. The offense was horrible last year for the Cleveland Browns. Defense held up that entire second half of the year. So I think this year, another year where they have everything together, um, they have more pieces in there. Maybe a guy like Perrion can emerge. Maybe a guy like JOK can emerge. And you start to see why this defense could be one of the better units in football. You talk about uh, you, you. You talk about a lot of these guys are you know these position groups are two two man deep, and you, something that really uh, jumps out at me. You, you look at your edge rushers, you know your defensive ends, Jadavian Clowney, Miles Garrett. Uh, you went out, you spent a third round pick on Alex Wright. You also go pick up Chase Winovich off the the Patriots, who you know was a guy who was kind of a 50-50 starter over there. Uh, with New England and also picked up Isaac Rochelle, who spent some time in Indy last year. You're really looking to me, it looks like you're looking to to keep the snap counts down a little bit to keep guys fresh throughout the whole, you know, an entire game throughout the entire season so that in the fourth quarter, weeks 16, 17, 18, these guys will still be playing just as hot with their hair on fire as they were in quarter one week one. So that's that's a that's a big that's something that really jumps out to me. Loyal well, another reason mm -hmm. what they would do there too is since you have Miles Garrett and Jadavion Clowney, 
you play like they play Miles Garrett inside a lot, right? So they'll mm -hmm. put and slide Miles over to three tech sometimes and Jadavion over to three tech to get him against guards. I mean, like if Miles Garrett, Jadavion Clowney over guards is just insane, right? So if you can get away with doing that on the passing set, then you're gonna want your edge depth to be a little bit deeper and versatile so you can have those guys out there. So like Chase Winovich is gonna see a lot of time next to Jadavion when Jadavion slides over to three tech. So he's in a way, he's not starting, but he'll probably get more snaps than like the second team interior defensive lineman because when they slide guys over to keep them fresh that way, they will just push uh, Chase Winovich up. It's one of the things they did with Tack McKinley last year, who unfortunately popped his Achilles, won't play this year. Yeah, and another piece you got that is very underrated, and that's a walk, you know, mm -hmm. Anthony Walker Jr. He's so smart, and you talked about Darius Leonard and and how JOK was compared to that. I mean, you know, he had a relationship with Darius that really helped him enter the league and stuff. You know, I'm a huge Notre Dame fan, and I agree with everything you said about Louis Cormor. I mean, he could he he could set this league on fire just like Darius did, and to have that that very intelligent and and coach's son type mentality and stuff. But, you know, it's just – that's priceless, you know. And the, and the thing is, you guys got him on the cheap. You know, he just – he's a guy that just wanted to get snaps. He just – you know, it wasn't about the money as much as just give me starting mm -hmm. reps, you know, and, and and it's proven out real well. But yeah, something, yeah. I, something I wanted to ask you about, and that's – that's you know, we haven't mentioned it, is Kate York. Because, you know, we talked about Jacoby Brissett. If he's starting – you know, the starting quarterback, he's not going to create these big leads. You know what I mean? Like I said, there's going to be a lot of tight games if he's your starting quarterback all early on. Do you think the the kicker, Cade York, you know, you got him on the fourth round, I believe it was. Have, it, what's the competition like for him, and what, what do you know about him? Oh, ain't no competition. He's, it's his job. They don't even have any yeah. kick on the roster. They've been very clear. They spent a fourth-round pick on him. Uh, <laughs> fun fact about Andrew Barry, uh, he hasn't cut any of his draft picks yet, so and they're not cutting the fourth-rounder. That's why Jerome Ford, even on a team that has three good running backs, probably still going to make the team, um, and Demetric Felton might be cut loose or, or put the wide receiver. I don't know what they're going to do with that situation, but I think we are just not good enough at evaluating these kickers. I don't think the process is good enough for evaluating kickers to justify taking them in the fourth round. Uh, if the Browns have figured something out, cool. If Kate York works out, I'll be wrong. Like, I don't care. Like, you know, ultimately, I want this team to have a reliable kicker. But, you know, I just question, hey, do we know we're good enough at this? Especially the Cleveland Browns, who have drafted Austin Seibert, which was a flop. Zan Gonzalez, who who is good now, but, I mean, flamed out tremendously here in Cleveland. He had, like, two missed game winners and then just, like, missed the game time field goal from, like, 10 yards out. Just had a complete meltdown against the Saints and then ended up off the team. Um you know, it just hasn't worked out the last few times we went for these kickers. So I'm just a little wary on is are we good enough at the process to justify to keep spending high value picks on a on a on a position where it's been proven that, hey, you can get these guys undrafted if you just find the right one. Because, again, I don't think anybody knows what we're supposed to be looking for when it comes to a kicker. I don't think we figured out that formula. All right. All right, now that we got done with the depth chart, I want to bring up this, the 2022 NFL schedule. And it looks like we start the preseason off three games, as usual, uh, that, that has been knocked down since last year. Uh, Browns go to Jacksonville, then they host Philadelphia, and then they host Chicago. Is there a game uh, inside the preseason that – has you interested in just to watch to see uh, what some of your guys can do? You know, it's interesting um, this year because usually in years past, I'm like, hey, I want to play a good defense before they go in. Now that I think the Browns defense is going to be a much bigger challenge for this offense at camp, it's not as much of a concern. And also it's not like, Deshaun Watson's probably going to be that out there in preseason. Even if he's suspended 12 games, he's going to play. Um, so, you know, I don't think Deshaun hasn't seen anything before, right? Like this whole, it, it's not that same question of when you have a rookie where you're like, hey, I want to have him go up against like a base three, four and see what cover one looks like in the NFL from there and all that. Um, you know, so it, it's not as intriguing who the opponent is. Um, it, it's more or less just intriguing on like who you would see when you just casually watching these games be the backups for these teams. I mean, that's always fun. I remember 
find out that Josh Rosen was on the Atlanta Falcons last year. Did not know that one. I was like, wow, he's been lying Felipe Franks. That's bad. Hmm. All right. So we're going to break this down four games at a time. Um, we got week one. They start the season off in Carolina. That was a, that's going to be an interesting game uh, to say the least. Um, we've all, everybody knows about it. It's like, how in the world did they pull that one off? Did, did the schedule guys have a, you know, crystal ball, but we don't even know if Baker will even be the starting quarterback over there, you know, mm-hmm. because they you got the whole Sam Darnold situation uh, as well, that they spent a lot picking uh, him up last year. Um, then you got the jets coming to town in week two. And then of course, the rival Steelers in week three, and then the Browns go to Atlanta in week four. During that first month, is there a specific game that you're really, really focused on? One being the obvious answer here is week one, right? When they play the Panthers, even though it's matchup wise, I don't think that's the most interesting one, but storyline wise, Baker Mayfield coming back here. I know that everybody's made the whole Baker's got a chip on his shoulder. One of the things I, I would point out is I think the defense also from the Cleveland Browns last year has a major chip on their shoulder, given that they felt like they were playing playoff level football and that what held them back was clearly the quarterback play. I mean, like it wasn't Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt holding this team back offensively. It was the passing game. And you could point one finger at why that did not go there, given that they did also go two and one when Baker Mayfield set out. So we'll see what happens there. That's always going to be interesting. I think, the next very interesting game in that set, probably what because Pittsburgh's at home on a Thursday night, the Browns should win that one. It's I think probably of the first four, you'll go with the Panthers game being the most interesting. Okay. Okay. Well, uh the next four game after that, which will uh be the first half of the season, and it's kind of hard to say first half now that there's 17 games rather than the 16 games. Mm-hmm. Look at this run. You got the Chargers at home. Then you have the Patriots coming to town. Then you travel back to Baltimore. And then you host the the team that represented the AFC North in the Super Bowl. Um, Loyalist, real quick, your big game that you want to focus on for the first half of the season. Like you said, I, I really am interested to see a lot of these games. But I would look at the Ravens game because that's, you know, two times a year. And honestly, that's going to be one of the teams that they're going to be competing for, for that playoff spot. So I think that this game is going to give you a lot of information about how uh, things could possibly go later on in the AFC. So I like looking at that Ravens and Browns game and the way those two teams, I mean, both very strong in the run, you know, like we said, if, if it's Jacoby Brissett, this is one of those games where is that defense going to be able to, uh, to, stifle him enough to where he can't use some of those weapons and stuff. So that would be my game. All right. And for this second month, Quincy, what, which game are you looking at? All of them. Um, (laughs) It's going to be a test, right? Like uh, this defense, especially the secondary should be one of the better ones in the NFL. Well, better have it all together by the time you get to October 9th, because there's nothing but high octane offenses and McCorkle Jones. So we'll see what happens there. Right. But you play the Chargers. I mean, when Bill Belichick is considered the break in, in, in this run, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, that says a lot. Right. But even the Patriots put up 45 unanswered on the Browns last year at the beginning part of the season. So still a lot to redeem there. Um, uh, Baltimore Ravens, look, everybody has all these hot takes about Lamar Jackson. I have watched this man dominate the Cleveland Browns too much to have a bad word to say about him. He is him. <laughs> he is that good. He's a good enough. He's he's much better as a passer than people assume. I have seen him murder us on pass, and we all know what he could do uh, with his legs. So just, just an absolute monster. Mark Andrews, I mean, that's just always going to be hard to stop. And in the Bengals, what well, the Browns have had, like Joe Burrow has not actually ever beaten the Browns since he's been there in Cincinnati. Um, and the Browns have had a favorable record over them. They even beat them twice last year. So we'll see what happens this year with the Bengals. But again, you think about all those DBs I mentioned for the Cleveland Browns, and then you think about all those wide receivers that you mentioned for the Bengals. And then, you know, by that time, maybe it's a, a six week suspension for Watson. You know, he's a couple of weeks off of that suspension. That could be a game. And I think that is on Monday Night Football where at Browns Bengals game, I mean, put a huge circle on that, especially since that's on national TV. Awesome. Well, I'll tell you what. 
uh, right after the Browns Bengals, uh, they they traveled to Miami, who, in my opinion, have one of the most underrated defense and defenses in football. Uh, they really know how to get after a quarterback as well. And then, hi, it's the Buffalo Bills. Uh, many people, uh, many analysts have the Bills as the best team in the AFC. Uh, they had the number one defense in the NFL last year. They went out and got Vaughn Miller. And then, of course, we all know about Josh Allen and that uh, offense. Then they host the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Only and- Tom Brady. Only Tom Brady. It's just Tom. First you get the Patriots, and then you get Tom Brady just a few weeks later. Uh, and then uh, finishing off that month, uh, well, it's it's technically not in the same month, but it's the four-game stretch with the Houston Texans, which you know, we don't even know. I mean, what's what's going on with them? In that, in that four-game stretch, what game are you circling big time? Oh, the biggest one on there, right? Browns, Texans. No, <laughs> <laughs> even though that will be interesting because that could be a time where Watson's able to come back. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested and in, in, uh, terrified to see what the crowd reaction is going to be of, of him back there, right? Uh, I don't think they're going to be playing like a thank you, Deshaun. <laughs> so. Yo, know, that's gonna be interesting. It's nice to be on the other side of that, by the way. Like, <laughs> it's nice to not have to, when LeBron left, like it, it, it was not fun, like having to boo him. You know, secretly <laughs> wanting him to come back. So it's nice to be on the other side of that. But yeah, that's gonna be an interesting one. But um, you know, that Bills game, right? Because the the Buccaneers are gonna be really good, but like you're only gonna play the Buccaneers again if you get to the Super Bowl. The Bills, on the other hand, like they might come up. Right? This is a year in the AFC where the Bills could be like the three seed, like and, and you have to play them as the six seed or something like that, right? Like the, the seed is going to be weird to where they could be a first round matchup for a very good team. So you want to see how you match up with them. Uh, last time the Browns played the Bills was in 2019. Clearly very different Josh Allen, very different team that the Browns trotted out there. But we'll see what happens um, on this on this stretch. But yet again. You got Tyreek Hill against when you play the Dolphins. You got Josh Allen. You got Tom Brady. You got the Texans after that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's just, again, this is a stretch of incredible offensive players. If this defense comes out of this stretch with like top five rankings, I mean, it, you're talking about one of the best defenses in, in, in football right there it, that, that went up against the test and held its own. Absolutely. That is something that a lot of people don't actually think about when they go look at stats. Uh, that, that they just run up the stats and don't actually take into consideration who they played and where those stats came against. Mm-hmm. Uh, finishing off the season, you got visiting the Bengals, uh, then you're hosting the Ravens, then the Saints, then you go to Washington, face Carson Wentz and the Commanders, and what a season finale as the Browns travel to Pittsburgh against what I consider to be a very scary defense as well, right? I mean, a very aggressive, opportunistic defense. This could be a very interesting – this is a very – everyone in the uh, North has a very strong schedule. Oh, my goodness. Um, Loyalist, last half of the season, what game are you circling for the the last half of the season? Yeah, for the last half, I'd like to go back to that Bills game because I like the way Cleveland is going to sit there and – You talked about Miles Garrett and these guys, you know, they're really going to be able to test that O-line for Buffalo. And and thing is, is if if you can push them into the fourth quarter, you know, even if you don't come out with that win, you guys could springboard in. And then, like you said, you know, now you got the Bengals, you know, that one, you know, make another, you know, make that statement game. You know, they are the the golden childs of last year, you know, sit there and, and put that win in the book and stuff. And then, you know, that just springboards you into the Ravens. So, like I said, that Buffalo game is just huge, I think, for you guys. Okay. So, last five games of the year, Quincy. Uh, man, you got to be playing your best football down the stretch. Which game do they need to be playing their best at? I think it's that Ravens game. The Bengals are an interesting one to me. Because, like, I acknowledge that they accomplished a lot last year. They look like a very scary team, everything in between. But it don't never look like that when they play us. So it's just like, <laughs> it's it's kind of the reverse, right? Like, when 
like I guess it's how Pittsburgh felt when they because the Browns would like have these good teams come into Pittsburgh, play terrible, and then play good after that. And for the Bengals, it's kind of been similar to where like they, they'll be really good. Joe Burrow's playing really good, and then come in, Joe Burrow throws a pick six to start the game, and we're just rolling in on them, and we're up like 41 14 on them. And you know, so it's like the fear factor of the Bengals is not there yet. They could do a lot to accomplish that this year if they beat the Browns, obviously, but. I have more fear of Lamar Jackson than I have of the Bengals just because I have seen Lamar Jackson come back from the toilet and throw a game winning touchdown right? just to kill my heart. Right. I have seen Lamar do these things um, to the Cleveland Browns in the games. Um, so I think that's probably it. The Steelers at the end of the year, we always play the Steelers at the end of the year. This is going to be interesting because it's at Pittsburgh, but no longer Heinz Field. It's like a Kreischer Stadium or whatever they call it now. I think the stigma's gone now. You know, no Big Ben, no Heinz ketchup bottle in the end zone. That's not the same stadium anymore that the Browns just always get thumped at. So there's no fear factor going into that. So hopefully we can uh, just make a new history at that stadium and make Pittsburgh miserable there. Um, and then the commanders, they can sneak up on you. Very good defensive line. Late season Carson Wentz, though. So, you know, it, 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 it can go either way. With, with how he helps you out. And it is going to be interesting to see what they can do here at this end stretch. They should be healthy. And you're thinking prop more than likely Watson's back by this time of the year. So we'll see. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting end of the year. Who knows who's going to be playing when? Because once you get to this part of the year, somebody's always injured on the team and it changes the outlook of everything. But yeah, the schedule, I mean, on paper right now, it looks very difficult, but I always say this. Schedules look a lot more difficult during this time of the year because you're thinking everybody's going to be healthy. You're thinking everybody's going to be there. That's never the case, right, where everybody on every team is incredibly healthy and everybody has their star players week in, week out. We also know that some teams are healthy and just stink for a couple of weeks, right? Just don't have it together where you're like, oh, man, this ain't working. And then they get good at the end. So it's about when you catch a team, how they're playing at that time, who's healthy when. So, again, the schedule game is fun to do, but I always caution fans, like, when you get yourself, oh, the schedule's too hard, we're going to lose all – it's never going to be as tough as you think it's going to be, uh, yeah. the schedule. It, it Something always happens, or something happens to your team and your easy schedule, like the Ravens, right? Ravens thought they was going to be cool last year, lost the entire team by the end of the year, ended up losing their last six games, couldn't get to the playoffs, couldn't win a division, ended up in last place. They were in first place when Lamar Jackson got injured, finished the season in last place because of all those things that accumulated and popped up on them. And, I mean, they still were, like, close in all those games, so they're a really good team. But, yeah, it's just – it's one of those things where it always looks tougher at this point in the year because we're just accounting for everybody being there, right? The Panthers game. It's, it's a tough thing to guess right now because Christian McCaffrey, who knows if Christian McCaffrey's actually going to play that game, right? Who knows who's going to be available for that game? So things always happen. You got to take this week by week. Trying to plan out a whole season in July is kind of tough, but it's a fun thing to talk about. So we come down to the end. Well, real quick, I'm just going to say December 18th against the Ravens. I think it would be smart if Barry went ahead and had his maintenance guy make sure that the locker room bathrooms are closed off uh, <laughs> for that game so that Lamar can't do the halftime refresher. Uh, <laughs> to the locker room, they just need to make sure they have some roadblocks. Like, he needed to clear some <laughs> before the two-minute warning. That was the issue, right? They just let him get back out there. I'm like, was it nobody going to park a cart inconveniently? Like, you know, if somebody has him. You got to take your shoes off right now. You know what I mean? Like, let him know he can't wear his cleats. Make Like, we, we just needed to hold him up a couple of seconds. If he got to do his business, you know, let the man do his business. But that don't mean we just got to let him run back out on the field, you know what I mean? <laughs> Did he get hand sanitizer? Like, are we sure that he was following protocol? We need somebody to get on that. That's all, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. It is time to, to finish up the show. We're going to go ahead and do our ceiling four season record predictions uh, for the Cleveland Browns this year. I'm going to go ahead and go over to Loyalist and let him let us know what he thinks the ceiling and the floor for the Cleveland Browns this year will be. Well, a lot of it dic is dictated by the quarterback. Because, like I said, if you've got Jacoby, I feel like there's going to be a lot of those games where you're a little bit closer than than you would like to be at the end of the game. Uh, I would say the floor would be around nine wins. You know what I mean? Uh, still a decent season, but probably keep you out of the playoffs. But I would say that the ceiling 
is somewhere in that 12 to 13 game. I am going to discuss this in a situation. All right. So the ceiling and floor, like you talked about, is it's all about Deshaun and 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 Jacoby. If if Jacoby has to play every single game, look, I know what you're getting with Jacoby Brissett. Uh, he's got a cannon, but he's afraid to use it. But he takes safe shots. He knows how to handle the football off. And he's he he protects the ball. He doesn't turn it over very often. It's like Derek Carr light. Yeah. The same yeah. frustrations. You're like Derek Carr can run. He refuses to run. Derek right. Carr can throw the ball. He refuses to throw the ball. But you know what he is gonna do? Throw to the tight end 15 times a game. <laughs> and, and and the thing with Jacoby is you you sit there and there's plays where you're like, oh, they've got Jacoby dead to rights, and all of a sudden he shucks off a couple players, and all of a sudden he 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 can sit there and like he said, use that can of an arm and hit somebody for you know. 25, 30 yards just to break your heart where you're like, oh, we had him off the field. And now you're – Had him for a safety, safety, dead to right, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, when Von Miller had him dead to a safety and then he broke away from him and threw 35 yards downfield, uh, hit a guy, T.Y. T-Y. Hill, I believe it was. One right of the things the I've noticed right. with Jacoby, too, when watching this film, he's more clutch than people would assume he is. Like mm-hmm. He has some of his best football and some of the like tightest parts of the game because he could be very just like average sometimes at the beginning of these games. And then he'll just like pull out – like his game against what? Las Vegas when he was on the Dolphins last year, he like came back from 14, forced a double overtime. Like, well, not a double overtime, but forced overtime. Like incredible performance by him at late part of that game. Um, so, Absolutely, you know, he does have that in him. One thing else that uh, does not show up on the stat sheet that Jacoby Brissett does bring is an energy, an energy not just on, when he's out out there on the field, but when he's on the sideline watching the defense. You know, mm-hmm. he brings an energy. He pumps up the team to get them hyped up and to play even better. So, um, I mean, he's you're paying a quarterback and a cheerleader at the same time. The guy, the guy is a fantastic human being, uh, but. Mm-hmm. Make no mistakes. Uh, if Deshaun Watson's on the field, this is a this is a much 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 better team. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm I'm going to go with eight or nine wins as a floor, just because Jacoby. It is the first time he's going to be with with the Browns. Uh, it is also a situation where you don't know where what you're getting with with certain players. Uh, is Amari Cooper still Amari Cooper? Why did the Cowboys all of a sudden decide to let him go? You don't know. Generally, you don't get rid of a guy who is as good as he is. Because in my opinion, Amari is a really, really good wide receiver out there, right? Um, and you know, don't, don't know about injury, like you talk about injury. So I'm, I'm going to run floor of an eight. That's what Jacoby and maybe some problems. Man, the ceiling – with with Deshaun Watson is I, I'd say 14 wins. Uh this is a very, very good team all the way around with Deshaun Watson at the helm. Yeah, I would probably go nine wins as a floor. Um, I think they probably improve off of their win total from last year, regardless of whatever happens at quarterback. Um, and I think they're ceiling it's probably around eleven, maybe thirteen at the high end, just mm-hmm. because while I do think this team's going to be really good, I think they're also going to have to work out some things, um, some kinks in there with Watson or with Brissett, whoever is in there, in order to get that thing completely right. And that's why I think early on this season, especially um, whether Watson's in there or not, it's going to be relying on the defense. So that might cost you a game or two early that you didn't want to lose. But I think ultimately, once we get to the end of the season, this team's going to be one of those teams. You know, they might be, well, with 13 wins, they're not going to be a, a seven seed or anything like that. They'll probably be like a, two or three seed um, or maybe even a one seed. But this could end up being a situation where the Browns squeak out there like 11 wins, end up being like a five or six seed, and they're really not the team you're trying to play. Um, it, like it, it might be another situation where – I think this happened in 2020 where – there was kind of the debate whether you wanted to actually win the division in the South that year, because I think what Tennessee had to play Baltimore if they won versus if Indy, who did Indy play in the first round that year? In 2020. Bills. You, Bills. The Bills. Yeah. yeah. It was like either you play Baltimore or the Bills, which one did you want to go for? So, you know, it, it might be one of those things. Look, the AFC, there's going to be nobody you want to play in the first round. I don't think there's going to be any Cinderella's anytime soon. Somebody's going to have a really good quarterback and a really good team backing them. Um, 
whoever makes this playoffs. I mean, we ain't even talking about Russ. Russ is here on a good team. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, Devontae Adams is, is with Derek Carr. Who knows how that's going to work out? So th- this conference is going to have a lot going for it. You know, who knows? 13 wins might get you to six seed. Who knows how this is going <laughs> to shake out? But wow. yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how all of this goes uh, because it, it's going to be high caliber stuff this year. Absolutely. I, uh, this is a fan. This is why one of the reasons why we're breaking down and taking time out and breaking down the AFC this year, team by team, division by division, because of all the moves. The AFC is hands down the best conference in the NFL right now. There's no question about it. And um, I absolutely love uh, sitting here and, and covering each team, learning a little bit about each of them. Uh, again, um, Thank you so much, Quincy, for taking time out to come on here and give us your expertise on the Cleveland Browns. If you go ahead, uh, once again, tell everybody uh, where they can find you. You can find me at YouTube.com slash Quincy Carrier, also at YouTube.com slash Worst Take. If you want to hear me react to all of the takes from, from Stephen A. to uh, Colin Coward to Skip Bayless and everybody else in between, um, if you want to hear me react to their takes, what they're saying, Check out that Worst Take channel, but thank you guys for having me on. Absolutely. Hope to have you on again sometime uh, soon, and you know, vice versa. If you ever want us on, uh, feel free to reach out. And until next time, I'm Lawrence Owen. That's Colts Loyalist uh, with a special guest covering the Cleveland Browns is Quincy Carrier. And until next time, have a good one. Just because a guy's a player's not a household name doesn't mean we can't make him a household name.